Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin a live broadcast, but it's actually recorded. Uh, but it, we're live while we're doing it. Uh, <laughs> to discuss this book by Cardinal Robert Seurat called The Day is Now Far Spent. And uh, I want Vivian to begin with some comments that she has that we discussed at lunch today. Go ahead, Vivian. Well, that's jumping into a section, but uh, maybe I should preface it that at first, when I started reading this, the spirit of discouragement came over me because, you know, so many of us are concerned about the church and worried and, and anxious and, and uh, the word crisis. I was tempted to just remove the word crisis from my daily vocabulary. There's just too many crises. And when I first started reading it, I just went, oh, no, here we go. But the cardinal is, it's a tour de force. Every single point of importance for the church today, he is touching on. In fact, I don't see how we can get through the first section in 30 minutes, especially not the way I'm blathering well, right now. Here, that's something. Joseph, let's spend a half hour, 45 minutes on this, and if we only get a certain distance, we may have to enlarge our scope here and have more mix on this. I'm all, for, I'm all for being flexible. It's not a problem. But the, oh. the, yeah, good. Well, the turning point came for me when his chapter on the crisis of the priesthood, and he began this discussion on the importance of celibacy, which is such a timely topic because it's being debated right now, especially with the Amazon Synod. It's one of the topics on the agenda. Should we have married priests uh, for presumably pastoral reasons? And, and, you know, it's a discipline, right? We, really have to have strong opinions about this? Is this one of these things we can give way on in the sake of unity and so on? But when I, I was moved to tears when he began writing about priestly celibacy and how important this is to identify the priest completely with Christ, with Christ's priestly sacrifice being not just something the priest does, but who the priest is. The priest himself is the sacrifice in the case of Christian sacrifices to God. It's the priest himself, Jesus, who's the sacrifice. And when the human priest completely conforms himself to the life of Christ in this way, he's living in his very body, the cardinal says, the priestly offering of Christ. It was so beautiful, I was moved to tears. And one quote in particular, which sums up what I'm saying is this page page 64 and this really got me because the cardinal begins by saying this is the last paragraph on the page i wish to proclaim with many of my brother priests the profound suffering that disdain for priestly celibacy causes me exclamation point and there i got this glimpse of the suffering of priests who've embrace this calling to Christ, struggle to live it out, and now feel that the very offering of their lives is being held in contempt. This treasure cannot be relativized. Celibacy is the sign and the instrument of our entrance into the priestly being of Jesus. I don't know about you guys, well, you for sure, but that's the first time I'd ever heard that described so beautifully, so poignantly. Well, let's, let's start in Medios Res here. Let's start with this, and then we'll go back. I want to say something about the table of contents, previous things. But on, on page 65, I mean, I marked this too. He quotes John Paul II uh, in his uh, Pastoros Dabo Vobis, which is kind of magisterial doctrine on pastors I'm giving you what, what we should be. And he says, he, that is John Paul II, affirms authoritatively that priestly celibacy is not a mere ecclesiastical discipline, but a manifestation mm -hmm. of the sacramental representation of Christ the priest. This document makes it difficult to derogate from the law of priestly celibacy, even for a limited region. On the contrary, it paves the way for a rediscovery by the Eastern churches of the profound and radical ontological suitability of celibacy for the priesthood, ontological suitability. And he says, this paves the way for a rediscovery by the Eastern churches 
of this meeting because people will say, oh, well, the Orthodox ordained married men and Eastern churches in union with Rome ordained mm -hmm. married men. It's all based on a mistake and a fraud. There's another book, by the way, called Parenthesis and Parenthesis. Uh, right now, if you want to get this book, you don't have it. I mean, the only place you can get it right now, well, is the behemoth, but beside the behemoth in your Catholic bookstore, Ignatius.com. Go to www.ignatius.com. Get this book. Get it shipped next day so you won't be missing anything here. But we have another book called The Case for Clerical Celibacy, Celibacy by Carl F. von Stickler. He makes it clear that from the very beginning of the church, from the apostolic times, all the evidence we had is that while, yes, married men were ordained to the priesthood because that's all there were for the most part, mm -hmm. they were required and their wives had to agree to this, to be continent. That was the practice of the church. Continual. It was the undisputed practice of the church. Not always uh, followed, because we're all fable, feeble, you know, but it was in 7, 692, the Council of Trullus, which is an Eastern local council, where... The discipline was changed for the Eastern Church. It was based on two things. One, what was now regarded as a forgery, that a monk named Paphnutius from Egypt was at the Council of Nicaea in 325, and he had proposed this. That never happened. Mm. Number two, there was an African synod that African now means North Africa. Augustine was there, 390. It was in Carthage. And they had what called the canons of the African synods, and they reiterated the, the teaching of the church up to that time. And when in 692, the Eastern Council of Trullus wanted to introduce this novelty, they actually took the Africans and they manipulated them and they did fake news. They, they excerpted them and made it seem like this was something which was permitted earlier. It never was. So I'm sorry to say this. There's many good Eastern Orthodox priests. I know some of them, actually. It, they're, they're wonderful Catholics. They keep their traditions. But the married priesthood in the Orthodox Church is based on, one, a mistake. Mm -hmm. Paphnutius was never at Council of Nicaea. And number two, a fraud. They, mis, they, they purposely uh, excerpted and misrepresented the canons of the Council of Africa. So... To me, it's a little phrase here, but this is a powerful phrase. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, what John Paul II said paves the way for a rediscovery by the Eastern churches of the profound and radical unlawful suitability of selfish for the priestly state. I mean, this is, this is it's dynamite if you know what's really in there. Yeah, and he does give a little bit of that history, Father. Well, that's now, right. Go ahead. Uh, well, I... I don't even. I'm not even competent to summarize this history as you just so did as you did. I don't need to because you did. But some of this history, the cardinal does explain, and this this needs to be known. This needs to be better known. I don't think. I mean, I don't know about you, Joseph. You know, I didn't know any of what Father just said. And, no, 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 no. and there's this assumption. You should read more of our books. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I should. You're right. Uh, uh, there's this. There's a lot of false assumptions right now that that celibacy is just a discipline. That that the Eastern churches, da da da, and why can't we just all get along? And along comes Cardinal Seurat saying, "It's not what you think. This exactly. is essential. This I mean, is the, essential." The key here is that Jesus Christ, Son of God made flesh, is a man who is the bridegroom of his church, who is the bride. And he called men to be with him, follow him, to be united with him, to represent not just God, not even just Christ the head, but Christ the spouse, Christ the bridegroom. And therefore, yes, there can be exceptions, but those exceptions are, are don't derogate from the foundation foundational on the last reality that Christ is the high priest, he lived as a virgin, as a celibate, mm -hmm. and that we as priests do that not because it's some discipline imposed from without and we only began in the 11th century, as some people say, no, this was recognized from the beginning as 
an essential ontological characteristic of the true priesthood of Christ. Well, and it makes sense now, dare I go here, dare I go into this very muddy water, but it makes sense why active homosexuals should not be ordained because they cannot give up the love of a woman and the conception of children through the love of a woman. They can't give that up as a positive good that they desire. So that sacrificial nature that the cardinal is talking about is so essential to not just priestly doing, but priestly being. It just, oh my goodness, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Why, how this all fits together and why uh, this is not to bully or be mean or anything. It's about who Jesus was, what his ministry is all about, and how does that get continued in time and space by human men who aren't going to live it completely and fully i mean who who can i mean what jesus asked of us was hard but that's no reason to get rid of it but you can't really mean that because you're a woman and what do you mean well i, I mean, mean yes i am a woman yeah. <laughs> last, last i checked yeah. you, you have to stick up for the feminine race and demand the priesthood don't you oh my gosh are we gonna go there no. i mean okay let's joseph I want yeah. to the beginning of the book but you want to comment yeah. on you, you, yeah you've we, been we, I, 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 I'm, strangely I, I, Okay. I'm, I'm, ple I'm pleased that um, that we um, dived and delved in to that aspect of things. Priestly celibacy is obviously part of it, um, but you know, it's page 65, so I think at some point we want to yeah. move back to the beginning. And yes, let's go here. back. Let's go back. And I want right. to. You said, Father, you wanted to look at the table of contents before we did anything else. Even even before that, even before that, I want to look at the dedication page. Yeah. Uh, it's not numbered. I can't tell you what it is, but the three dedications for Benedict the Sixteenth, peerless architect of the rebuilding of the church. What a beautiful expression! What a beautiful, you know, uh, description of Benedict the Sixteenth, peerless architect of the rebuilding of the church. Second dedication for Francis, faithful and devoted son of Saint Ignatius. So. This is not a screed against Pope Francis. Not at all. In fact, he quotes Pope Francis continuously. He does. So he's, I mean, clearly, and, and what he says about uh, loving the Pope and loving the papacy and, and respecting oh, yes. it again and again. So another beautiful thing about this book, it's not a divisive book unless you want to make it a divisive book. It's a unifying book. Third dedication. For the priests throughout the world, in thanksgiving on the occasion of my golden jubilee of the priesthood. So he's just, just a priest, you know. Wow. Okay, so that's his dedication. The table of contents. What I want to point out here, Joseph, is that, uh, you know, the, the cover is a little bit gloomy. It's kind of a dark thing here. He's walking down. The day is not far spent. That sounds like, oh, my gosh, we're at the end. But that's actually a passage taken from Luke where... It's when the apostle, the two disciples on Emmaus, are walking and they're kind of they're discouraged and the day is far spent. But what happened? What happens? Jesus they meet comes. Jesus, mm -hmm. and he encourages them. And he, he mentions that in here too. They had their backs turned to Jerusalem. Yes. They had the backs turned from the crucifixion because they were so discouraged. Now this man comes. He he reveals Jesus to them. In the breaking of the bread, he reveals he's Christ. Now they're full of encouragement. Now they come back. So this is meant to be a book of encouragement. But the great thing about it, mm -hmm. he's not sugarcoating the present state of the church. No. He is he's describing it in all of its black and white stark reality. So part one. Well, first of all, <laughs> the kind of prologue, alas, Judas is scary. He's talking about the betrayer, right? Part one, spiritual and religious collapse. So he's talking about how bad things are. Part two, man belittled. Hatred of man, which means male, female. We hate gender. Sex, Father. We hate sex. Well, no, male and female. We love sex. We hate gender. <laughs> well, they've confused the two words. Uh, gender give us your bumper sticker. Even, uh, oh, yeah. Joseph, you'll get a kick out of this. I wanted to make a bumper sticker that would say, nouns have gender, people have sex. <laughs> I think that would just clear it all up, don't you? If you want it on a rainbow background. Yeah, I, I was going to put a rainbow on it and really confuse the other side. And then part three, the fall of truth. 
moral decadence and bad political habits. So this is all all the bad news, okay? Yeah, yeah, I'll say. But part four, rediscovering hope, the practice of the Christian virtues, and then finally the epilogue, postscript, let nothing trouble me. So this is, what I love about Carl Seurat, he, he simply tells it like it is, but he doesn't lose faith, hope, or charity. I wonder if that's an African thing. Tell it like it is. Because wow. when our younger daughter was a volunteer in a field hospital out in the bush of uh, Uganda, I said, what's the hardest thing you're dealing with there, dear? She said, the Africans are very blunt and direct people. <laughs> <laughs> she said, they just come right out and tell me I have a pimple on my nose. <laughs> and she'd never experienced this kind of directness. But they were full of joy, and she loved it there. Don't want to give a wrong impression. Well, certainly, you know, with Cardinal Lorenzo as well as Cardinal Savar, they have be certainly getting some fine examples of leadership out yes. of Africa at the moment, and thanks be to God for it. Yes. Yes. All right, Joseph, uh, I, what do you want to do now? I want to go forward, but I've got some things. Uh, my first... Well, I, I actually, you know, I, I highlighted quite a bit in the wonderful opening section. I don't want to call it but, because it doesn't give itself a name, but alas, Judas Iscariot, um, uh, because I, I think it, it begins uh, with the title itself uh, in a heart-hitting manner, which is which is uh, uh, necessary. Personally, as a literary person, I'm delighted that the one of the two quotes there, alongside the Gospel of St. Luke, is Shakespeare, and specifically the, the reference and allusion to Macbeth. Now, when you think about the Macbeth as an, as an, an analogy of what's being spoken about in this book, which is treachery, um, um, and a man's fall from, from heroism and grace to, to basically worshipping demonic forces and causing destruction, um, and then we uh, uh, analogize that with uh, the way that he talks about certain people within the hierarchy of the church as being Judas Iscariot, um, I think that there's a very powerful cocktail uh, here of pointing the finger where it needs to be pointed, quite frankly. Well, also, backing up a step from what you said here, uh, Robert Seurat was born in a little rural town in Guinea in West Africa. He was a pagan. His parents were pagans. There were Irish missionaries there, the Holy Ghost Fathers, that ran a little school. He didn't have shoes, okay? But these missionaries came, not indigenous missionaries, to preach the gospel and to educate the people, started a school. His parents became Catholic. Little Robert Seurat noticed that these priests in their cassocks, walking back and forth, were praying the divine office. Were praying. It had a deep impression on him mm -hmm. that led his vocation. He went to the seminary. He was under communist control. He had to leave for Senegal to go to the seminary, study for the priesthood. He became a priest. He was ordained at the time. He was the youngest bishop in the world to replace his own archbishop, who was in jail because the communists yeah. were, had imprisoned him because he was resisting them. And when he became bishop of Conakry, I think is the name of the capital of, of Guinea, he was actually on a hit list by the communists to take him out because he was not going to be co-opted by the Communist Party in that state. That was when John Paul II brought him to Rome, and then he became, uh, I think he became uh, bishop, archbishop, one of the prefects of a congregation there or something like that. But anyway, this, this man who's quoting Shakespeare, mm -hmm. yeah. oh, no, Shakespeare, a dead white European male? Right. African man who, look at his erudition oh. throughout this book. Yes. The people he quotes. I know. His brilliance. His brilliance. He was a little barefoot kid. Yeah. In Guinea. Yeah. And, and, and you compare that with the most corrupt elements of the church that come from the most comfortable parts of the world, right? That they, that, that this man has experienced suffering. He's experienced the, the consequences of decadent, post-enlightenment ideology, yes. right, such as communism. Um, he's been uh, persecuted for his faith. 
Uh, and he's a man that's been, if you like, tested and tempered in the fires. Whereas you know, the, the real corruption in the church is coming from people that have been they've pampered, comfortable lives. You know, and it said that comfort is the great corrupter. Those that don't know the meaning of the cross, and when they do see the cross, they turn away from it. Uh, this is a man that's, that's actually lived with the cross and carried the cross from his earliest days. And these are the sort of people we need as leaders in the church, not those who are sitting in armchairs um, pontificating uh, heresy. Right. Uh, you know, and yet his humility, I would like to quote something that points to both his erudition and his humility. On page 88, uh, he says, I don't want to talk about the church as a business to be evaluated by numerical results. He talks a lot about what are we using to measure. By the way, it's a constant theme of on, right. on Spire. There's a shout out. Absolutely. And, and I like the fact that he, he roots this whole, in this last Judas Iscariot uh, section of the book, he, he, he roots it all in theology. Uh, he talks about the fact that the devil had already entered into Judas's heart. And we already know that Judas... Here, the real Judas, the, the scriptural Judas, is a type, of like the archetype, of which many people in the, in, the, in the church today are actually types. He then talks about, having mentioned the devil entering Judas's heart, he pronounced the ancient words of rebellion, non-servium. So having talked about Judas, we're now talking about Satan. Uh, and then he talks about the, the, the Judas's communion at the Last Supper being the first sacrilegious Communion, and again, look, by extension here, suggesting that um, that there are many sacrilegious communions going on now. People that don't believe the teaching of the church, don't believe in the real presence, um, uh, and um, are Judases, and yet are practicing the faith as if they are are um, believers. Right. Well, if I could continue with this quote, he says the crisis that the church is experiencing is much deeper. It is like a cancer eating away at the body from within. Many theologians like Henri de Lubac, Louis Boyer, Hansers von Balthasar, and Joseph Ratzinger, the very authors that Father Fessio founded Ignatius Press to publish, I might add. These men have analyzed this crisis at length. I will be only the humble echo and extension of their analysis. I mean, to just list all those in one line, the erudition of this man to have read them, and then the humility to say that he's only going to be an echo and extension of these. I mean. And he quotes them profusely. He, he quotes in this them book. profusely. But to me, it was so wonderful to have a great yes. book like this and have him validate our 41 years. Yes. At Ignatius Press. Beautiful. We were founded precisely to, publish to make these authors available in Europe. Yep. High five, Father. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's go back to the beginning here. I'm on page 15. You got something before that, Joseph? I've got, I've got just one thing on page 13. I just, this okay. is a wonderful, a wonderful epigram that uh, His Eminence has given us in the middle of the page. Relativism is the mask of Judas disguised as an intellectual. <laughs> I love that, and I'm going to use it. Why didn't I? It, yeah. Why didn't I underline that? I underlined it. But but I'm saying uh, one thing I do want to say. I've never called a cardinal his eminence. I don't like that title. I don't like his excellency either. Cardinal Sarah is good enough for me. His, his eminent. He he's very eminent. No question about it. But th this baroque, uh, you know, use of titles to me, just call me father. Okay. That what what name can be better than that? Don't say Reverend Fessio or something like. I'm not a reverend, I'm a father. Okay. Okay. And by the way, I can't find it at the moment, but the mask, the mask, you know, this intellectualism that substitutes for faith and how he talks about the contempt with which people of this sort treat the poor. In other words, they, they've they intellectualized their faith. They've lost their faith. They've given over to doubt. He talks about that in the case of Judas as well. It starts with doubt. And then they want to water things down. They want to change things to suit themselves. And then they use the poor as the reason for doing this. And he says, what contempt you must have for the poor if you think we can't hear and follow the gospel too. Oh, it's really powerful. Well, that, let's see if I can find that. Uh, 
Because that has to do with the Amazon Senate. Yes, it where does. Where they're trying to condescend to the Amazon Senate people saying, oh, look, you poor people, you know, you really can't do this on your own, but we'll, we'll, we'll bring you the enlightened mode of, of Catholicism. Right. Oh, yeah. We'll lift your burdens for you. We'll get to that. I got it here somewhere. But Yeah. Okay, anyway. That, that one, Joseph, I'm glad you brought that one up. Yeah. I want on page 15, he describes how he's going to go forward here in the middle of the page here. Forgive me if some of my words shock you. I do not want to put you to sleep with soothing, lying talk. I seek neither success nor popularity. This book is a cry of my soul. Yes. The cry of love for God and for my brethren. Yep. Yeah, you need a tissue, Father. Uh, give, give, <laughs> give me a tissue, please. I'm yeah. sorry. Well, this yeah. is... No, you, his <laughs> anguish. I mean, that's, like I said, I started out very discouraged at first. But the more I heard the anguish of his heart, a heart in love with God, a heart who loves the church, I just started to cry myself. I just, the, you just really feel it, uh, that this is a man speaking out of love. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, you know, and I, I, but I do want to, you know, in the midst of all this, I mean, I, I'm going to go back another page here, um, to page 14. Okay. Where, when he says, again, it's about a third of the way down, the devil drives us to division and schism. So again, I like the connection, the juxtaposition of the devil with division and schism. He wants to make us believe that the church has betrayed us, but the church does not betray. The church full of sinners is herself without sin. And I think that this is something which we need to keep at the heart of well, our lives, but certainly at the heart of this discussion, because you know, we're talking about sinful men and indeed Judas Iscariots uh, within the church, including very high up in the hierarchy. But the church herself is the mystical body of Christ um, uh, and the bride of Christ, both of those things. Um, and therefore, the church is herself um, unsullied by this. We are sullied by it. Um, uh, the faithful are sullied by it. But the church, Christ himself is not studied by it. He might be crucified by it. Um, and insofar as the church is the mystical body of Christ, the church is herself being crucified by it. But the church does not betray us. The church is not the sinner. It's people within the church who are betraying the church. And, well, since you took me back to page 14, one other thing I outlined there towards the top, Christians are trembling, wavering, doubting. No question about that. Yeah. I yeah. want this book to be for them. To tell them, colon, do not doubt. Hold fast to doctrine. Fast to prayer. I want this book to strengthen faithful Christians and priests. Hold fast to doctrine. Hold yeah. fast to prayer. And he's inspired. You talk about trembling there. He's inspired. Page 15. We bishops ought to tremble at the thought of our guilty silences, our complicit silences, our overindulgent silences in dealing with the world. And he speaks this, uh, th th that sentence in the context of uh, just, just above it, in a little while I will appear before the eternal judge. What will I say to him? In other words, that the, this, this good, good holy cardinal is seeing things in, in the context of eternity, in the context of, of we're, we're living this life with a goal in mind, which is which is an eternal goal, uh, and we should be trembling at the thought. And it makes you wonder to what extent these modernists actually do believe in God, because they're clearly not trembling uh, at what they're going to say to Christ when they when they when, they, when Christ uh, gives them a litany of their betrayals. And then we have to be careful because he's always cautioning against our response to this being one of causing even further division, you know? And so even like using a word like modernist and then just like whoop, that whole group over there, you know, including people like de Lubach and von Balthasar now are being called modernists and yeah. heretics. And it's like, whoa. Well, but yeah, but we, again, we, we have to use technical language and modernism is a heresy of the church. I mean, I, 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 maybe we should use the word modernism and not modernists, and that's fair enough. But modernism is a, is a heresy of the church, and it is, is in fact the prevailing heresy 
that's being that's being uh no but her, her point is you just can't shove everybody into that category just because you don't like what they're saying right and well, you, have to, you have to as in all as in all words you have to use them correctly right and they're being used very sloppily you're at the british, moment you're british right? yeah. being used but, very uh, sloppily I, was, gonna... I, when I use the word modernism in this context i thought he wasn't using it sloppily no i wasn't i wasn't uh saying that you were i'm only saying that we have to be the cardinal on almost in every chapter, he's cautioning us against breaking up into factions, team spirit, uh, and us and them sort of situation, which is easy to do when you get angry and frustrated, as we are, yeah. with, with, with what's going on. And, and we just have to exercise a great deal of caution and work for unity. So yeah, and, you may, and you mentioned unity, and absolutely correct, and page 17, you know, uh, about just over halfway down, um, the, the, the cardinal says the, the hermeneutic of reform in continuity that Benedict XVI taught so clearly mm -hmm. is an indispensable condition of unity. Yes. So again, I mean, uh, we have to be careful here because I, I would I would say that hermeneutic the hermeneutic of reform in continuity that's a, a, a very good technical term, but mm -hmm. it's actually seeing doctrine in the light of tradition. You know, and we have to be careful because we could start saying we mustn't use words like tradition because that could be seen as being um, partisan. Um, you know, because some people call themselves traditionalists, right? Um, so right. Uh, yeah, we, we, we have to use the English language, apps, you know, with precision, uh, with accuracy, so that we can communicate. And and, and this again, is perfect. If we want unity within the church. We have to stay true to the tradition of the church in its doctrines uh, and what it's always taught in, in continuity from the beginning. When, that is that is the source also, of it. But it also leaves room for development and reform. In other words, things are not just supposed to be frozen at a certain point in time. Somehow we have to be both faithful to the deposit of faith that's been given and open to uh, reform in continuity with that. But that doesn't... Which is, which is tradition. In other words, that all reform has to be in the light of tradition. As someone said, we're not passing on ashes, but a fire. <laughs> right. It's a living thing. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, we've just, I'm sure we've just all seen this a lot, right? Oh, which mass do you go to? Oh, you're that kind of Catholic and this kind of thing. I mean, we just really have to tread carefully. Yes. All right. Well, so he said, mentions the, in this little inter, intro here, he mentions the, uh, the unity of the church, this is page 16, rests on four columns, mm -hmm. prayer, Catholic doctrine, love for Peter, and mutual charity must become the priorities of our soul and of all our activities. Prayer, Catholic doctrine, Peter's love, love, love. of Peter. Right. That, yeah. that's, that's, that's a, uh, we have to correct that in the book. By the way, on page 18, it should be love of Peter, not Peter's love. Right. And fraternal charity. So, all right, we've we've gotten past the first little. Un, un, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 we probably want to be at least keeping an eye on the clock, Father. At this point, I think I am doing that. I figured, let's, give ourselves, let's give ourselves fifteen more minutes and see how far we get. That that sounds fair enough. Okay. So I, I my next comment is on page forty three. Anybody want to go beyond before that? You you got all kinds. Of uh, I have something on twenty nine. And, and I have something on 24 and okay, 25. You go first. Well, I just, his discussion of what is faith, because so often, especially when we get into debates with Protestants and so on, and faith kind of gets reduced to belief, right? And uh, faith, as he explains, using Abraham as a model, it's a yes to God, it's a surrender to God. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's worth people spending time on. Um, uh, uh, in prayerfully, and he makes a comment here that he re echoes later about the paganism of his upbringing, right? That the pagan gods, this is on page 25, uh, inspire terror, fear, dread, anxiety, hence the temptation to magic and idolatry. It is imagined that they demand bloody sacrifices in order to attract their benevolence or to appease their wrath. And while that might be a description of the ancient world, it kind of fits what we're living through right now, a resurgence of paganism. And 
back to the Amazon Synod, you know, are we going to go into places where paganism is rampant and tell them that their gods are just great? Or are we going to go in there with the liberating message of Jesus Christ, which after you make this total surrender to God, you're actually in a state of freedom and love. And he discusses this so profoundly that has resonance not only to these places with indigenous peoples, it has resonance to the modern world yeah. where we're seeing paganism yeah. replace real faith. Well, we're indigenous too. We're just indigenous here. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's all I want to say about that. All right. Amen, sister. Okay, yes, on page, it's on page 29, um, okay. just below the, uh, the question in italics. Um, some people would like the church to be transformed after the model of modern democracies. In it, the government would be entrusted to the majority, but that would amount to making the church a human society and not the family founded by God. Um, so again, you know, what, what is the church? Is it, is it just a human democracy? Is it a human institution? Or is it actually the, 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 um, the mystical body of Christ? Um, and, and I love that from this idea of the majority, he talks about the most important minority. In the history of the church, the little remnant is what has saved the faith. A few believers who remain faithful to God and to his covenant. In other words, that basically it's the saints who are the people that should rule the church. Uh, and the saints are always the minority and are never the majority. And the, ma the majority who are striving to be saints but are not saints should bend the knee in deference and reverence towards the saints and accept their leadership of the church. It's not about numbers, it's about sanctity. I can't uh, do anything except say yes. Amen, brother. Amen, sister. Amen, brother. <laughs> if so, I'll do on this, I'll just say my amens. Uh, I, I'm still going to be on 43. Anything before okay. 43? Well, I, I, I might quickly quote Ratzinger, because there's always, always going to have an excuse to quote Ratzinger, Father. Uh, page 35, um, that um, Cardinal Soir quotes uh, um, Ratzinger here, um, top of the page. There is one thing, however, that we can say, that it is, and that is that an orientation of the church toward the world, that would mean a turning away from the cross. I can't read this. The way from the cross would lead not to a renewal of the church, but to her decline and eventual decay. That the church either has to be oriented towards the world, in which case it will decline and decay, or it has to be oriented towards the cross. And, and, and uh, one is a negation of the other. Uh, I, I, I beg to differ on how yep. that's supposed to be read. Well, I certainly read it badly, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, so an orientation of the church toward the world that would mean a turning away from the cross would lead not to the renewal, but to the decline of the church. In other words, if you're going to turn toward the world, you have to turn to the world with the cross. You can't turn toward the world and away from the cross. So he's not saying don't turn toward the world. He's saying turn toward the world with the cross. That's the difference. And uh, that's just so Rotzinger, actually, to yeah. keep these, so you're, 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 hold these things right together. Yeah, mea culpa, mea culpa. We, we, we can turn towards the world, but we have to be carrying the cross when we do it. Agreed completely. Exactly. Yeah. And also, by the way, this is this on page 34, there's a note here. In a speech given in Bamberg in the 1966 Katholikenkag, Catholic Day, the amazing thing to me about the way he quotes, he's not just quoting from the major works. He's picked out these little talks that Ratchet was given, yes. you know, and John Paul II gave. They're not even published anywhere, not even in Ignatius Press. Right. I don't know. I don't know what he does in his spare time, but he, he must. <laughs> he Actually, must I do have a of... question for your father, because um, this did confuse me, this footnote, I must admit. I, I can't, I mean, I don't know the biography of, uh, of Joseph Ratzinger uh, as well as you do. Obviously, was he really a cardinal as early as 1966? No, he was not a cardinal then. Well, so yeah, so well, he was. It was eighty-two. Right, but, it, the, but the footnote says Cardinal Raskin points out. Then you have the superscript five, and it leads you to that, which is a bit misleading. Uh, okay. Hmm. See what I mean? Maybe that, maybe that's something oh, to do with everything. And that, that's a constantly bedeviling thing because he's been pope, he's been cardinal, he's been bishop, he was a scholar before all those things, right. and so 
it's hard not it's difficult it is yeah. I, I guess I, I was just a bit confused i thought i'm sure yeah. it was part of the 1966 you're right and you know, here but... i would like to if i may joseph on page 35 again answer the question why why is it important to bring the cross with us as we as we engage the world because jesus christ is the unique source of salvation and grace through the cross by offering his death and triumphing over sin he restores supernatural life to us the life of friendship with him that will be completed in eternal life that's the good news right only right. good news in yep. a world full of darkness and sin that is the good news that we can participate in the supernatural life and as you've said many times joseph on these book clubs there is no life without the cross right, right. we can't right. offer the life if we don't also offer the cross I offer the cross to people by making them suffer. I can. <laughs> and he's good at it, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've got a lot of practice. Well, I'm uh, anybody more? I, I'm, well, the, the one thing I would suggest, Father, is that as you've been waiting very patiently because you've been waiting to get to your page and, uh, and we've had that <laughs> before, um, I, I suggest that you, you should be the last word because we've been 45 minutes, I think. Yes. So maybe you comment on the page you want and then we'll reconvene uh, the next time and take just take it up from here. We'll take let's do that. Let's do that. Except that anything prior to page 43, please. No, the, I have nothing prior to 43. Now. Well, this is interesting for me on page 43 because he's going to quote Romano Guardini. Mm -hmm. uh, but he says, uh, well, the question is from Nicola Dia, and God bless Nicola. He asked very short questions, and that allows Carlos Rod to give very long answers. So he asked, have we lost a sense of God's transcendence? Of course, I would simply say yes. We, we go on to the next question. But Cardinal Sarah says, in the Catholic faith, transcendence is expressed and symbolized by the altar. What does it signify? In his book, Meditations Before Mass, I mean, who's read that? I mean, okay. Romano Goni explains it marvelously. Its meaning is probably most clearly suggested by two images. It is a threshold and it is a table. So the idea of a threshold means this is the door that opens. This, this is the entrance into something beyond us. Mm -hmm. So he quotes Guardini, but then in brackets at the, toward the bottom of the page, he makes his own comment. He says, that is why it is not fitting for the priest celebrant to stand, quote, on the other side of the altar, close quotes. That is to say, mass facing people, as we have almost in every parish today, as though he were taking God's place. In doing so, he is like a screen that hides the transcendence of God. He is a veil that hides the majesty of God. Thus, instead of looking at God, the faithful look at the priest, and he, by his movements, gestures, and many words, models the mystery, hides the divine transcendence, period, Close bracket. Wow. Wow. Yeah, well, I'm wow exactly. Wow in unison. <laughs> and and that and that's something that so many people, it's just never been explained like that. Yeah. You know, that's something right. that you know, re, uh, yeah. people. Oh, need he's to turning hear his this. back to the people. Yes, that's yeah. how they put yeah. it. Yeah, turning not, his back. Not turning to face God and bringing us with him, but yeah. turning his back to us. And if this were just out there and explained, people would understand and embrace it they would right understood i mean i must admit well you know and i'm certainly not trying to be sound divisive here but when, when i go to a, a mass where the priest celebrates versus populum uh, for large parts of the liturgy i have to have my eyes closed because i, I find that the priest gestures and the priest actually a distraction from the sacrifice um and, and so i have to have my eyes closed so i can actually can I, I can actually keep myself focused on the mystery of the liturgy and you keep your ears closer in the homily? So, uh, I, normally, I, I normally close my ears for the homily part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, all right. So we're going to be back with you next week, and we're going to continue. We're not going to know how far we're going to get. So you keep reading, and we'll be discussing this. It will take as long as it takes to go through this book as it deserves. Yes. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, as you, you know, it might be helpful to have a, 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 a reading assignment, however. I mean, obviously, try to read the whole thing as soon as you can, but... I'm guessing that we're probably not going to get beyond part one uh, by the end of the next by the end of the next session. That the so because obviously we want to spend our time on this book. That's evident 
Um, so maybe at least make sure uh, as a minimum before next week, if possible. Very uh, good. Part right. one of the good. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We will